Is there anything you require to make your stay a more pleasant one? All I require is to sit in the sun, read my book, alone. Hey, Star Trek book fans, welcome to the latest episode of a series that I haven't returned to for quite a while on this channel, The Trek Lit Report, where I offer a review of a newly released Star Trek novel. The novel I'm talking about today is a new release from last year, and it's taken me a little while to get to it, but I am finally talking about Star Trek The Next Generation Collateral Damage by David Mack. As usual, the first part of this review will be spoiler free, and I will give you a warning when I'm about to get into spoilers. So without further ado, let's jump into the book. The first thing I want to talk about a little bit is the cover of the novel. Uh, definitely a departure for Star Trek novels recently. It is, of course, uh, in the new trade paperback format, the slightly larger format with a slightly higher price point. Uh, but the cover is really interesting, a uh, really great design, I think, um, an interesting bit of art here, and a return to the classic Star Trek The Next Generation title font, uh, as opposed to what we've gotten recently in the last few years with the TNG relaunch novels. So yeah, I, I think this one looks really striking on the shelf. I really love the kind of more abstract design of it rather than, you know, kind of a Photoshop job or something like that that we've gotten recently. So kudos to the cover artist for that one. As for the content of the novel itself, this novel is interesting in that it goes back to tie up some loose ends in the story going all the way back to the A Time To series, you know, really going back and hitting some story points that have been up in the air for a long time. Uh, I won't get into the specifics of those story points until after the spoiler warning, but suffice to say, there's a lot of really interesting loose ends tied up. Not as many loose ends tied up as I thought there would be, however. Uh, at the time that this book came out, I really felt that it was going to wrap up the novel verse going into Star Trek Picard because we know that the continuity of the books post Star Trek Nemesis the events, anyway, are incompatible with what we've learned from Star Trek Picard. But this book really doesn't do that. Instead, it, it is just another chapter in the ongoing story. Now, we have been told by David Mack specifically, and other authors as well, that there is a plan that the publishers and the writers are working on to wrap up the Treklet post-Nemesis verse and tie it into the Star Trek Picard continuity somehow. How they're going to do that and what that will look like, we still don't know at this point, but it is something that they are apparently working on and do have a plan for. So I'm really excited to learn what that will look like. As far as the story itself goes, I found it a very satisfying read, a, a great drama. David Mack has such a great handle on these characters and, you know, a lot of people find his writing a little darker than the typical Star Trek novel or Star Trek story. However, he has such a great grasp on these characters and the intricacies of the Star Trek universe. I really have enjoyed every single novel that David Mack has written without exception. And this one definitely is not an exception as well. It is a top-notch novel. I would say a five out of five on this one for me. I very much enjoyed it from beginning to end, uh, both as someone who has followed that novel continuity for all of these years, that kind of payoff, that kind of reward for being that longtime reader is really great in this novel. However, it is also a great standalone story that I think could very well be enjoyed by anybody regardless of their history with the Star Trek literary universe. But I do think it would inspire that reader to go back and read those stories. Now, if that's not a time commitment that you want to make, if you've not read those stories, I can understand maybe a bit of hesitancy in reading this novel, but I really think it is worth it. I think it's a great story, even though it doesn't 100% tie in with the current canon continuity. Uh, but hopefully, again, we'll see if that is something that can be rectified on the novel end of things. So, uh, yeah, top marks for this novel. Absolutely loved it. 
Okay, from this point on, here is your spoiler warning. I am going to get into spoilers with regards to the novel Collateral Damage. So if you haven't read it, you may want to pause here, go read the book and come back to it. I'm sure you can get that uh, done in an hour or so and uh, rejoin the video then. So as I mentioned, this novel goes all the way back to the A Time To series, which chronicled the mission of the Enterprise, the last couple books of that series anyway, to the planet Tezwa to deal with a dictator who had taken power there and had commandeered some particle cannons that Starfleet had installed on the planet as a last-ditch measure in the Dominion War. However, the installation of these cannons so close to Klingon territory is a violation of the Kittimer Accords, and in order to cover that up, the President of the Federation undertakes some clandestine missions to uh, make sure that that information is not revealed, that these cannons are destroyed. However, of course, Picard and his crew have evidence of what the Federation leadership at the time had done. And Picard kind of takes part in a coup, basically, to oust the Federation president. Uh, and, you know, it is definitely stepping over the line of morality. The president himself was, in fact, assassinated by Section 31 shortly thereafter. However, Picard had no part in those actions whatsoever, merely in the bringing of that evidence to the president and forcing him to step down. Now, all of this has come to a head thanks to the revelation of the background secret ops of Section 31 as revealed at the end of the novel Section 31 Control, also by David. Mac. So all of this information has come to public light and of course Starfleet finds itself having to call Picard back to answer for his possible crimes. We also have a secondary story going on which involves a group of Nausicans conducting attacks on various Federation targets. Now the Nausicans are a race we've seen in Star Trek before, notably in the TNG episode Tapestry. Their planet was effectively destroyed during the Borg invasion in Star Trek Destiny. Again, linking back to more of the Star Trek litverse, which I just, I love all the touchstones that this book touches upon. It makes it feel like a, a broader, bigger, cohesive universe. So the story with the Nausicans is an interesting one. The main antagonist is a Nausicaan by the name of Kinogar, who, like I said, is conducting these attacks. The message by the end, interestingly, isn't a good one for the Federation, basically. It's kind of a realization that the Federation has dropped the ball in response to helping various worlds recover from the events of Star Trek Destiny. The Nausicaans have lost their world and no Starfleet vessel has even gone to Nausicaa to check for survivors other than, you know, one trip shortly thereafter. There's been no attempts to aid the Nausicaan society. And it's very sobering and it's something that you know, Worf, who's temporarily in command of the Enterprise during this period, must kind of represent the Federation in, and he realizes the Federation's shortcomings and failings in this matter. Speaking of which, I want to talk a little bit about the character of Worf in this novel. I think he is handled superbly by David Mack. This is a character who acts in a very thoughtful and reasonable manner as acting captain of the Enterprise in dealing with this situation. Now, I want you to think about those words, thoughtful and reasonable. Are those words you would ascribe to Worf, thinking back to like season one of Star Trek The Next Generation? Absolutely not. The growth that this character has shown, the strides that he's taken, the character development that has gone on, is leaps and bounds. I mean, he's gone, he's come so far in his development as a character and each of these character points feels absolutely natural and authentic. So uh, kudos to all of the writers of the lit verse, the writers of deep space nine for advancing that character as well. Uh, I just love where Worf is at the end of this novel and how it's completely different, a completely different Worf than what we've seen in Star Trek before. So 
Um, this is someone who I could absolutely see as permanent captain of the Enterprise after Picard one day moves on. So another part of the story involving the Nausicans has to do with agents of Starfleet intelligence. And there are some familiar faces here and, and very unexpected, I found, in these parts of the books. So one of the agents on the ground that Starfleet intelligence has is Thadian Okana. And you may remember him from the wildly popular Star Trek The Next Generation episode, The Outrageous Okana, from season two. Uh, he was that, you know, Han Solo roguish type freighter captain who, uh, yeah, was definitely not someone I was eager to see again. However, he has uh, matured. He is now a, an agent of Starfleet intelligence. And I have to say, you know, my initial skepticism when reading that he was the character in this book that uh, was, you know, this underground undercover agent, uh, I, <laughs> it was, I was uh, totally caught off guard by how much I enjoyed the character in this part of the novel. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. Other familiar faces at Starfleet Intelligence end up being Naomi Wildman, who, of course, you may remember from Star Trek Voyager, who's all grown up now and uh, I think a lieutenant in Starfleet and a member of Starfleet Intelligence, as well as Sam Lavelle, who is her director. Uh, Sam Lavelle, you may remember as one of the ensigns in the episode Lower Decks from season seven of TNG. Uh, he was the one who was constantly worried about how Riker saw him and he ended up getting the promotion at the end of the episode. Uh, so, you know, interesting to bring back these familiar faces. In some ways, this could contribute to a feeling of small universe syndrome, but I feel like it really works here because I, I don't know, just the, the, the situations they find themselves in, they felt like Maybe not a natural outgrowth of the characters as we saw them, but at the same time, not wholly unbelievable. I definitely, their, their personalities shone through and, you know, keeping in mind that this is, wow, tw I mean, 20 years on, I guess. I, just quick in my head, I don't know if that's right, but from when we saw Sam Lavelle and, you know, a decade on from where we saw, uh, more than a decade on from where we saw Naomi Wildman and even further than all of that for Thady and Okona, uh, I think this is a really interesting uh, place to put these characters. And I know this is something that would never happen, but I would love to see like a, a spin-off Starfleet intelligence series with these characters somehow. So now we come, of course, to the main thrust of the story, Picard's culpability in the events of the A Time To series, and most notably the Tezwa coup in the ousting of President Min Zaif. Now, again, this was another excellent part of the story, of course, and one in which we see more familiar faces, uh, most notably in this case, Philippe Louvois, who was a captain and JAG officer in the fan favorite episode, The Measure of a Man from season two, and who is now the attorney general of the United Federation of Planets and the one who is pushing the case against Jean-Luc Picard. I thought her portrayal in this novel was very interesting. Sort of hints of what we've seen before when Picard describes her in Measure of a Man, that, that kind of zeal, that kind of almost obsessive nature in going after Picard here. And at first when I was reading this book, I felt that that motivation was a little unwarranted. But as we get into it, you know, you learn a little bit more of the situation. You see how she's reacting to things. And then at the very end of the novel, you get her side of it, her justification, her reasons for feeling so betrayed by the actions of Picard and her desire to push this case, I think, uh, felt very real once you kind of get that missing piece and get the motivation behind what she's doing and why she's doing it. So excellent uh, use of the character here. I thought that was really interesting and, and a lot of fun. As fun as, you know, your favorite captain being on trial can be. Now I should say, I guess it's not a trial, it's more of a hearing, but in this case, all charges against Picard do end up being dropped. However, the judge does make the recommendation that Picard is never allowed to hold flag rank. He will not be allowed to advance past the rank of captain while serving in Starfleet, which is really interesting given what we know happens to him in the Star Trek Picard timeline. So it's just yet another kind of way in which these two 
timelines, universes, realities, I don't know what you want to call them, uh, are a little bit incompatible. But again, waiting for that answer to see how they tie it all together. And uh, I think, given the writers involved, we're not going to be disappointed. I think it's going to be a really great and really fun way to to see how these link together but regardless this is still at this point a standalone uh reality a standalone set of circumstances from what we see in star trek picard so on those merits i think this is an excellent story i again five out of five i really enjoyed this and i think it was a great way to wrap up a lot of these long-standing storylines now when this book first came out bruce gibson and i on the literary treks podcast spoke with david mack about the novel here's a brief excerpt of that conversation and that that was for me one of the most important things about writing this book was to interrogate the concept of what are the obligations of a supposedly powerful and benevolent nation. Um, in this case, we find that while the Federation has been pretty good about responding to the crisis on its own worlds, especially very pretty worlds like Risa or Deneva, repairing damage on important political home worlds like Vulcan and Telar and uh, Andor, uh, we find that when it comes to something like Nausicaa, uh, who, you know, as a people, they were always standoffish, they were belligerent, they were politically independent. They didn't align with us or anybody else. Um, you know, they, they pride themselves on their strength, uh, on their individual, uh, you know, uh, on their sovereignty, let's say. But when they take a hit like this, when the Borg incinerate their whole planet, probably kill 70% or more of all Nausicans in the universe in one shot, and there's nothing left. There's no Nausicaan government, no Nausicaan military, no Nausicaan economy nothing they got nothing left as it's said you know as we say right in the book and I, I went and i made sure to check with other authors i looked for other references to see if anybody had done anything like people visiting nausicaa or whatever and i found nobody had ever followed up on this particular story thread in a, in a lot of ways those of us who write the star trek books forgot about nausicaa as much as the federation did you can hear the rest of that conversation on the Literary Treks episode. I'll have a link in the description below as well. You can uh, listen to it on YouTube here by clicking the card that appeared somewhere up here as well there. So thank you all so much for watching today. And let me know in the comments your thoughts on this novel. Uh, I think... You know, this is one that could garner a lot of debate. I think there's a lot of people that maybe didn't like it as much as I did. But for me, this is definitely, you know, top tier Star Trek uh, novel material. So if you agree with me or you disagree, let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks, of course, to the Patreon supporters for their help in bringing these videos to you. I really do appreciate all of your support, especially during this tough time. It's tough for a lot of us. I'm still uh, without a job at the moment. And uh, yeah, the income from these videos is definitely not enough to pay the bills. So every little bit really does help making this channel better and bringing these to you. So thank you so much. I'll see everyone in the next video. Until then, as always, live long and prosper. And as we say on Literary Treks, live long and read on.